Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Dr. Gerald Dirks, how you been? Oh, praise God, I've been fine. It's good to have you here on the Dean Show again. Uh, good to be back. Now, uh, about a year ago around this time, you were with us and we were very delighted to have you come on and share your experience, your, your journey to Islam, which Islam simply means to acquire peace to, by submitting to the one God, to the will of God. And so many people, we're, we're on so many, we're on a few satellite channels now, and not only do we broadcast here in Chicago on the local TV station, but now, thank God, we're on several different satellite channels. So, so many people have gotten to hear and benefit from your story. So if you can just kind of recap uh, for those who didn't get to hear your interview, you can go to thedeanshow.com, but just kind of bring us up to speed and, and the rest of the people of how you, in short, you know, end up making this turn towards Islam. And then we're going to come back to atypical Christian. Okay. Well, um, you know, I, I started out um, as an undergraduate at Harvard and then went into the Harvard Divinity School for three years during my Master of Divinity. And I was, in fact, an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church Yes. Uh, at the level of deacon. But upon entering seminary, especially a good seminary, one is exposed to a lot of information that the average Christian layman is, is never going to be exposed to. And uh, that information has to do with the reliability of the biblical texts, alternate versions of the texts that are out there, etc. And uh, changes that we know have been made in the text, uh, sometimes even knowing when and where those changes were made and why they were made. So a person comes through this experience and uh, it uh, shakes where one thought they were going. It shakes the foundation upon which they thought they were standing. Uh, and so as a matter of fact, upon my graduation from seminary, even though I was now an, an ordained minister, I was what I call an atypical Christian. Atypical yes, Christian. Yes, one word, atypical. Now define not, that. They heard me say it, but now you said it again. What does that mean, atypical well, Christian? Well, for me, an atypical, yeah. atypical yeah. being one word, Christian, was what I was. I didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. I didn't believe in the concept of the Trinity. Uh, but I certainly did believe that there was one and only one God. So that's what I would define as, as being an atypical Christian. Did you ever speak in tongues? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Some people would, would make this as a proof that, you know, Christianity, I... I you know, that, yeah. yeah, so what do, you, what do you think about this? Just to get off the topic for a second, like if somebody mentions this, someone sent me an email, they said, yeah. well, this might be a proof that Christianity is the truth because you got people, you know, it's a phenomenon, people speaking in by the power of God. Well, they're, they're speaking something. Something. But uh, I have yet to hear of anyone tape recording uh, a session and and uh, qualified linguists uh, looking at it and saying, oh, I recognize that language. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, it's always uh, unrecognizable. So, whatever. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, so let's go back now. So you became an atypical Christian. So even before seminary school, you were preaching, teaching the yes. Bible? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now you went to seminary school. You were exposed to textual criticism? Textual criticism, uh, form geschichte, form criticism. Yeah. Early, uh, early church history, yeah. et cetera. And you went deep into this. And then I remember you saying in, in our last interview that you were listening to some of the preachers preach and teach some of the things that you knew they weren't in the Bible. Well, I, yeah, I, I knew they weren't uh, uh, legitimate uh, things to be being taught. Give us an example of that. Oh, I, I can recall one, one minister one Sunday morning um, who was uh, basically doing a give me money sermon. Yeah, give me money sermon? Yeah, you know, give the donate money to the church yeah. sermon. Uh, where, where basically he began to uh, really stretch uh, some uh, biblical concepts about uh, giving. Yeah. So tell us now, you became an atypical Christian and you believed in one God, like many people, they mm -hmm. believe in one God, they don't believe in the confusion, 
that's out there, a lot of these man-made mm -hmm. uh, things. And you were kind of stuck up on, for a while, just being away from Islam and everything else. So how was your life then, at that moment, when you were just an atypical Christian? Well, you know, my wife and I tried to live our lives in what we believed to be a moral and ethical way. Yeah. Um, you know, every now and then I'd, I'd go to church because I thought it was an important family thing to do. It wasn't something I did very often, and like I say, I often, you know, ended up gritting my teeth at what I was hearing yeah. uh, being said. Um, but, you know, I, I continued to pray. Mm -hmm. uh, did a lot of praying. Directly to God? Oh, absolutely. Not to any prophet, saint, or... No, 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 to God. Just to the Creator? To God. To God. Uh, you know, I continued studying. I would frequent the local seminary bookstore and see what they had in, etc. Uh, and, and read up on some of the later, uh, the latest uh, archaeological finds, etc. Yeah. So now you're an atypical Christian, now you came to accepting Islam. How did that happen again? Well, that started primarily by having contact with some Muslims in the Denver, Colorado area. Yeah. By observing their lives and, and finally uh, you know, recognizing they were living their lives in a very moral and ethical way, um, quite at variance with the society around them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and asking myself, okay, now where, where are these people drawing their religious strength from? Yeah. And so um, I began to read English translation of the Quran, began to read books on Islam by Western authors. Um, and the more I read, the, the more uh, I ended up saying to myself, well, you, you know, there's nothing here with which I disagree. Yeah. You know, this is basically what I believe. Now, some people get hung up on the Arabic and mm -hmm. you having to now, you know, dress a certain way and, you know, do certain things mm -hmm. that maybe you aren't accustomed to. So did you have, did you become an Arab now because you became Muslim? No, absolutely not. And in fact, you know, this is nonsense, uh, yeah. what you're saying. Um, you know, as far as dress code goes, Islam prescribes that you dress modestly. Yeah. And, and there are some specific requirements in terms of that, in terms of, for, for a male anyway, you know, things going down at least to the knee and at least above the, the navel. But uh, there, there's no prescription that says you wear a thobe and a kufi uh, or, a, you know, a sari or, or any other non-Western clothing. Mm -hmm. You know, you certainly wear your own Western clothing, yeah. just modest clothing. So you're still an American? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you don't have to give up now. You don't become a Pakistani or you don't become an Arab. Abs absolutely or, not. Absolutely not. You just become one who's submitted to the will of God. Sure, sure. That makes a lot of sense. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back with more here on The Dean Show. Death and the Day of Judgment, the mercy of Allah. These are the things that finally made me realize there is no time to delay anymore. I wanted to take my shahada right there. The essence of spirituality is to become more sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, contemplate death itself. It is very, very scary, but it brings you back to reality. There is a life which is everlasting in the hereafter. And you have to make a conscious decision of which group of people do you want to be of, the people of heaven or the people of hell. Back here on The Dean Show with Dr. Gerald Dirks. And people can go to thedeanshow.com to see your full story on how you came to Islam. Now, we really want to encourage people to read the verbatim Word of God, the Quran. Yes. And before we go into that and dwell upon that, you were reading the Bible and you were finding that, was there Islam in the Bible? Was it calling you to acquire peace by submitting to the one God? And this is what led you finally to Islam? Was it, was it reading the Bible? Did that help whatsoever? Oh, absolutely it helped. Absolutely yeah. reading the Bible helped. And I think anyone who reads the Bible with an open mind uh, and reads it afresh. In other words, don't read the Bible by, through the lens of what you were taught in Sunday school. This is important now. Read the Bible afresh. What does it actually say? Yeah. This is the key. Now... With the Qur'an, many people think that, okay, it's the same thing. You've got multiple versions of the Qur'an, mm -hmm. like you do with the Bible. How many versions of the Bible do you have, actually? Well, usually when we say versions, what we're really t talking about is different translations. Uh -huh. um, the difference, however, is that when we talk about different translations of the Bible, the different translators go back to different sources yeah. or different manuscripts. 
King James Version of the Bible goes back to fairly late Greek sources. I mean, it's, it's not very old. Something like the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible goes back to very early uh, textual sources uh, to derive its translation. Now, having said that, it is the case that there are different Bibles. Different Bibles? Yes. So would that be like in one Bible you have one verse taken out and another one put in or some things in mm -hmm. one Bible? Like the... Like you have whole books. Whole books out. So wouldn't that constitute a, a, new, a different version? Well, yeah, but usually I can say when people say different versions of the Bible, they're really talking about different, different translations. But in, in reality, the, uh, if we look just at the Old Testament, yeah. the Protestant Old Testament does not have all of the information in it that the Roman Catholic Old Testament has, yeah. which in turn does not have everything that's found in the Greek Orthodox Old Testament. Yes. And you look at something like the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and they have a radically different Old Testament than, than the other three. Same things to be found in terms of the New Testament. Uh, now, the Protestants, the Roman Catholics, and the Greek Orthodox all agree on 27 books of the New Testament. But you look at other Christian groups, such as the East Syrian uh, or Nestorian Orthodox Church, they have a 22-book New Testament. They take five of the books and they say, no, no, we don't accept these. The Coptic Christian Church includes First and Second Clement in their New Testament, mm -hmm. which are not found in, in uh, the other Bibles. And again, you go to the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, New Testament, and, and you find some wildly different books. The bottom line is Christianity has never, ever agreed on what constitutes the Bible. Is it true that we don't have a copy of a copy of a copy of anything original? Well, we don't have anything original. Nothing original? No, there's nothing original. What yeah. we, we have are, are typically much later copies. And, you know, people sometimes say, well, you know, there's, you know, P52 or, you know, whatever. And, you know, that's very early date, maybe 120, 130, 150. Um, but, you know, something like P52 is a little fragment. Mm -hmm. Contains like five verses maybe yeah. or something. You know, so, so uh, we don't have. And this is different. With the Quran, we do have. We, we have still existent copies of the Quran that was made under Khalif Uthman, written Quran. Yeah. And this was made within, you know, a score of years. The original. Of, of Prophet Muhammad, yeah. peace be upon him. So is that what helped you finally also to realize that, you know what, this is a book that is not man-made, but is divinely sent? C certainly the provenance of the Quran is much better than the provenance of, of most of the Bible. Yeah. But it goes beyond provenance, historical provenance. It goes to content. Uh -huh. And when we look at the content of the Quran, you know, it clears up some things that are confusions yes. in the Bible. For example? For example, let's take the story of Prophet Joseph. Yeah. You know, we're told in both the Bible and the Quran that Prophet Joseph had a vision in which the sun and the moon and, and uh, 11 stars bowed down to him. And in both the Quran and, and the uh, Bible, we have basically have the same interpretation that, you know, his father and mother and, and uh, 11 brothers will bow down to him at some point in his life. Yeah. Now, the only time this could have happened was after Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers and later rose to become the vizier of Egypt and his brothers and father you know, moved to Egypt. Now, the thing is, in the Bible, we're told that Joseph's mother died giving birth to or shortly after the birth of Benjamin, the youngest boy. She would have been long dead and buried long before Joseph uh, was even sold into slavery, much less rose to be the vizier of Egypt. There was no way, according to the Bible, she could have ever bowed down to him. In the Quran, however, we're told that Joseph's parents, plural, came to Egypt. We don't have the story of uh, Joseph's mother dying, yes. giving birth to Benjamin. We want to encourage people to read mm -hmm. the verbatim word of God, the Quran. This yes. is what you did, and you realize that this is indeed from the creator of the heavens and earth. It's not made by men, multiple men, or the Prophet yeah. Muhammad, peace be upon him. So now someone might say, you know what? This, you claim, is from the creator, but it's in Arabic. The original mm -hmm. is in Arabic. Yes, it is. So how can I benefit? I'm an English-speaking person. Well, you, you, first of all, you have to get a good English translation. Okay. And let me emphasize that, a good English translation. 
because there are some translations out there that are not good, okay. that are in fact misleading. And you want to get one that's easy to read. And there is one that has just recently come out by uh, Brother Yahya Emmerich, mm -hmm. who's an American and a Muslim, uh, who has translated the Quran into modern American English. Yeah. And this is important. It's Without modern, the thou, thus, none of that. Yeah, no, no. You, and not the thou, thine. Yeah. Uh, this is important because most translations of the Quran that you look at have been translated in sort of a King James English yeah. to make it sound like the King James Bible. Most Americans are not familiar with King James English. And this is true whether it's the second and third generation of Muslims in America or whether it's non-Muslims picking up a translation of the Quran. Most of them are not familiar with King James English. They have difficulty reading it. They have difficulty understanding it. And they need something in straightforward, modern American English. And that's what Yahya Emmerich's translation gives us. But it gives us much more. Now, I'm holding up the extended study edition. Yeah. of the Quran. So this has commentary and everything? This like includes sir, uh, chapter introductions. It includes uh, historical context. In a different font, you have the historical context in which the following verses were revealed. This is sometimes very important in getting the proper understanding of what the verses are saying. Yeah. So you have the historical context. But you also have commentary, almost 2,700 footnotes worth of commentary sometimes discussing linguistics, why something was translated a certain way, sometimes giving a saying of the Prophet Muhammad that help explains the text, uh, sometimes uh, providing other information that provides a context to help understand the text. So, The Meaning of the Holy Quran in Today's English, Extended Study Edition by Brother Yahya Emery. This is certainly what every English-speaking Muslim should be reading. Also. Oh, absolutely. Um, for non-Muslims, either get this one or there is another one, same author, called A Journey Through the Holy Quran that doesn't include all the commentary footnotes, yes. but uh, provides you with all the rest of the information. Um, either one. And these are available, by the way, at Amazon.com or at... Uh, Ifna, that's I-F-N-A dot net, uh, which is Brother Yahya Emmerich's website. Let's take a break and we'll be right back with more here on The Dean Show. Here on The Dean Show, and this is what we're really trying to encourage people to do. What you did, you were open-minded, humble-hearted, you had a connection with your Creator, and you wanted to do His will. Mm -hmm. Now, you got a hold of also this Quran, the verbatim Word of God, and you read. And we want to encourage people to read. One of the beautiful miracles of it, isn't it, that it's memorized by millions all over the world. And oh, today... You don't have different books of the Qur'an, it's just the one Qur'an. Yeah, there, there's different translations, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and the Qur'an has been translated into language after language after language. But when we really talk about the Qur'an, we're talking about the Arabic original. Yeah. And yes, that's the same. There is only one version of the Arabic. Now, you're as American as they get. I think so. <laughs> so now, an American who's watching and he sees you, you went to the top university, one of the top in the world, Harvard University. You got your divinity degree. You were a Christian preaching, teaching the Bible, eating Thanksgiving dinner, and you're from a small town, and everybody knows you. They love you. And now they relate. They, they agree. Look, I don't want to worship Jesus. I love Jesus. We love Jesus too, but Absolutely. we say he's not God. Never did he claim that he was God. This trinity is confusing. My mind is getting a little numb thinking about it. It's one God. And you proved in all of the different lectures that this was the teaching of all the messengers. So they like what we have to say, accountability, that no one's dying for my mm -hmm. sins. I'm going to have to be accountable in front of God. So I've got to do good. I've got to race yeah. for good. Yeah. But they, you know, this whole thing now, the identity, the it's culture. A issue. Huge issue. How did you get past it? With difficulty. Yes. With difficulty. You know, because when one does have an identity, uh, one has a national cultural identity, in my case being an American, uh, one also has a religious identity, which originally in my case was that of being a Christian. Yes. Even though I was an atypical Christian, that was still the sort of uh, cloak of identity that I carried around with me in terms of my religious identity. Mm -hmm. And it's a difficult thing to change identity. Yeah. It, it is a very difficult thing. 
Um, the thing that's important, uh, I would tell non-Muslim Americans who are watching. We call them the not yet Muslims. Okay, alhamdulillah, <laughs> that's very good, praise God. Um, you're not giving up your national cultural identity. Mm -hmm. You're still Muslims. You're still going to dress in Western clothing. You don't have to change your name. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take an Arabic name. And by the way, that's what it is. It's an Arabic name, not a Muslim name. Mm -hmm. You don't have to make these changes. You don't have to sit around eating biryani or... or you could still, you, I mean, even though you might have to go to Mick Clinic, you could still eat McDonald's? Uh, well... You know, if it's halal McDonald's? It, it depends where you draw the line. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. But sure, there are certain dietary restrictions. Yeah. You know, we, we don't eat pork. We don't uh, consume alcohol. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, aside from things like that, you keep your American national cultural identity. Yeah. Only change that religious identity. That's simple. Yeah. That's, and you're doing it for the Creator, the one who loves you, who yes. created you, who's the most loving. Yes. Yes, definitely. Okay, how could people get a hold of you if they wanted to invite you, they'd love for you to have to say, to their university, to a platform where you can speak in front of thousands? They can contact me at my website. We started with peace. We end with peace. Thank you very much. Peace, peace be to you, brother. Thank you very much. And thank you again for tuning in to the Dean Show, Islam. Mm -hmm which simply means to acquire peace by submitting your will to the one God. It is growing. It's the fastest growing way of life in the world today, yesterday, and tomorrow. And you can learn more about Islam here in the Dean Show. Continue to tune in every week. You can also call us if you have any further questions and you'd like to know more. 1-800-662-ISLAM. And until next time, we'll see you. Peace be unto you.